this is an interesting weekend holiday because it's it's not too frequent that you would celebrate or it's not really a celebration it's more of a remembrance holiday of the deaths of people the de- the deaths of heroes right usually when we think about holidays like you know certain types of famous people and, and their holidays is probably the the birth of them or you know the the arrival of them but you know this is a particular one that's focusing on the 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 death of people and and death is a very powerful experience i mean especially from one witnessing it on the outside death is something where we know it it has to happen it's it's a reality of life that no one really wants to think about or dwell on no no one really likes the idea of death there's a lot of fear surrounding death there's a lot of there's a lot of anxiousness you know that that comes with the idea of it but it's interesting how although it's so pervasive the the christian life does speak to there's a spiritual death but also a rebirth so i'm a gamer and you may have picked up on that if i haven't told you already but there is this game called death loop and it's a very fascinating game but the idea of it is you have to you have to take down eight bosses in in a period of time but in order to do so it, there's a death required to happen like you can't beat the game unless you die which is a weird concept and there's and, and even in even in other religions let's take let's take like hinduism for instance with the rebirth well in order to reach a new stage or a new form let's say you are a roach and now you're going to be a a dog or whatever you know the the hindu faith would say well there has to be a, a death that has to happen in order for a progress to occur and so it seems like in in the world's culture and in the mindset we we do recognize that you know in in a lot of ways there has to be death to certain mindsets in order to progress. Like if you want to get physically fit, well, you have to have a sort of death to a certain habit. Or let's say you like to go to bed at 3 a.m. and wake up at 11 a.m. or something like that. Uh, but then you realize, okay, if I need to work this nine to five job, I can't do that anymore. So there has to kind of be a death to something before something else is reborn. So we do sort of have this pervasive idea of death and a rebirth. But in the, in the Christian mindset, there certainly is a death and there certainly is a rebirth, but there is a, a, a one-time spiritual death that, that happens in a way. There's, there's, there's a death that happens to the death of self where we are going to give up something and in return we get new life. So for the, for the Christian walk, Gordy talked about last week how there's this temple, and in this temple there's purity. There's supposed to be purity of worship and just the way we do worship of God. But people were taking advantage of it. They made a market out of it. They, they turned it into something that God never designed it for. But God's heart is for, for a right worship. And in order to do so, there has to be what's called repentance or a change of mind. There has to be a, well, I have to like stop, essentially. I, there, I have to put something to death in order for something to be of life. So in John chapter 3, Jesus is going to have this really, really interesting encounter with one individual. It's interesting because it's not a crowd. It's just just one dude, one dude. And interestingly, he meets him at night. So let's take a look at this passage here. John 3, verse 1, it says, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born if they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly, I say, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it, is com- uh, where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. All right. So this, this passage starts out with this guy named Nicodemus, and it says that he's a Pharisee. So the Pharisees could very well have been this group 
around the Maccabean Revolt time. So there's maybe a, a, a little bit beyond like 100 BC or, you know, let, let's say sometime around then this, this group develops. And this group is very strict when it comes to the law. So what, what they do is they have this mindset, okay, we want to make sure we don't break the law. So in order to not break the law, let's create some rules around that so we'll never actually break the law. So let's say one of the laws is like, um, you can't carry a bucket of water on the Sabbath or something like that. And so they, maybe they say, okay, well, um, the ultimate breaking of the law is to like keep the Sabbath and not do work. So we're going to, we're going to consider holding a bucket of water like work or sinful. So if we maybe tie something to it and that is carrying the bucket and we're not actually carrying the bucket, then it's not sin. So they create all these very strange rules and there would be this idea too of like, well, you know, you couldn't do this sort of thing outside of your house on a Sabbath. So let's connect the homes together. And so we'll never break the Sabbath. So they had all these very elaborate rules of not breaking the Sabbath. But what ends up happening is they create all these rules on top of rules. And these are not rules that God has ever required. So Nicodemus finds himself as one of the leading rulers of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was a, was a Jewish group of 71 elders of the, the nation of Israel, and they were in charge of the social and religious life of the Jewish people. So this is, think of kind of like Congress plus the Supreme Court or something like that, you know, the highest ruling council of the Jewish people. So Nicodemus is a big deal, at least from the Jewish point of view. He's, he's a very important person. And he, and he is a member of this council. But what's really interesting about this is that he comes to him at night. Yeah. So one of the phrases I've heard is this, I remember in one of my devotional books, they call this section Nick at night. And so I was like, oh, that's funny. That's the, so they call him Nick at night. And, and what's really funny about this idea is like, why, you have to ask the question, why is he coming to him at night? Why not during the day? Why not? I don't know. Name, name another time. But it's interesting. It's like at night he comes to Jesus okay so we can you know may, maybe maybe there's a metaphorical idea of like night you know reflecting spiritual darkness or something like that uh, I, that might be pushing it a little bit we can think of maybe a little bit more practically and just just from a very straightforward perspective think about it so he's one of the Jewish ruling people the Pharisees who end up being Jesus enemies okay so He's meeting with him at night by himself, not with anyone else. Maybe it's the case that he's meeting with Jesus because he's interested in Jesus, but doesn't want anyone to know about this interest in Jesus, right? So he's, um, he has a private conversation because he, he, he wants to find out about Jesus, but he doesn't want anyone to know about it. So he meets him at night, and I don't actually know how he met him at night. You know what I mean? Like... He, he couldn't text him like, hey, Jesus, can you meet at like this tree, you know, at 11 p.m. or something? I don't know. Maybe maybe sent, they sent messengers or something, you know, early text messaging through people. Maybe that was the idea. But somehow he, he gets this audience with Jesus at night. OK, what's what's really cool, too, is the first thing he says is he calls him rabbi, which is a, a title. It's, it's a teaching title. It's actually saying, Jesus, like, I actually see you as an authority figure. I, I see you actually as equal to me in terms of teaching authority. Because once you're a rabbi, you are the, you are the spiritual lead of society. It's really fascinating. He calls him that. He, he, he says, this is your title. I'm, I'm calling you rabbi. Especially since we know Nicodemus to be one of the heads of the Sanhedrin. So Nicodemus approaches him, calls him rabbi. We, he, and, and you can tell he's processing through this conundrum, this mental conundrum he has, which is, we know you're a teacher and you come from God because no one can do all these miracles you're doing unless you're from God. But you can tell there's like a, I don't, I don't have my head around this yet, Jesus. He, it's interesting too, because Nicodemus doesn't even ask Jesus a question. You would assume maybe he would say, are you the son of God? Or maybe, can you do a special miracle for me, Jesus? He just makes a statement. He just says, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher. And, but obviously, you are performing miracles. 
and you wouldn't be from God in if like yeah so you can tell there's like a lot of puzzling a lot of wrestling there there's a there's a mental wrestling that's happening within him so he's having a hard time believing i'm sure you've had that experience too before where you're like i believe that but man i don't know if i it's hard to like put all the pieces together it's really hard for me to grasp the the idea that that is actually really true so we can all empathize with nicodemus at this point also interesting too because jesus actually doesn't even comment on his statement (laughs) did you catch that jesus doesn't even like add to or seem to carry on the conversation it seems like jesus just changes the conversation and he says hey uh you need to be born again like what what does that mean what does that mean to be born again and so so nicodemus is obviously a little confused because he said okay so you're saying born again and by the way, born again also means born from above. It means both at the same time. So like you're born a second time or you're born from heaven. Okay. So Nicodemus doesn't understand what Jesus is getting at because Jesus is throwing him like a curveball out of nowhere. Like, hey, you need to be born again. And he's like, wait, uh, how do you enter into your mother's womb? Okay. So my mom's hit here. My mom's here. Okay. I'm bigger than my mom. So physically that's impossible to be in my mom's womb again which we can understand nicodemus you know in his confusion because that physiologically doesn't make sense right i mean Corey, our little girl is outside of the womb and she's not going to be able to i mean she's five months old she's definitely not going to be able to fit back in here uh like space wise so i mean we can understand nicodemus is like confusion a little bit right it's like that that's impossible like, the, the, how, do, how do you be born again? How, do you, how does that process even work? So Jesus clarifies. And also notice too how he says, very truly, very truly. So, another, so what he's saying is like, amen, amen, or truly, truly. Like I'm, Nicodemus, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. That you need to be born again. So he says that you can't, you can't see the kingdom of God. You can't enter the kingdom of God unless you're born of water and the spirit. So at first you might be like, what, what kind of water? What is, what water? Like that water or this water? Like what kind of, what kind of water do you mean, Jesus? So he says, flesh gives birth to flesh, spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at me saying you must be born again. So I guess the question is, should Nicodemus be surprised at this saying about being born again? Let's go ahead and turn to this passage in Genesis 2. Just take a look at the beginning there. Genesis 2, verse 7. Okay. Genesis 2, verse 7. So it says, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So even in the beginning in creation, the same word in the, in the Old Testament, for, in the Hebrew, ruach, means spirit, so the Holy Spirit. And that word is also used for breath or wind. Okay? Now, interestingly enough, in the New Testament Greek, it's the same thing. So, so also in the New Testament, there's a, there's a word for spirit, and that word also means breathe or breath and wind. So with this, with this verse, what it's saying is there, there is, there is dust and then God has to breathe something in like his spirit has to animate something to come to life. And then if you turn to Ezekiel 36, this is also an important verse, I think, to bring some clarity to this mystery. Ezekiel, you hear her whimpering. Oh, she's dreaming. It's just her breathing. Oh, it is. She's snoring. <laughs> loud. That's funny. Okay, so Ezekiel 36, verse 25. Ezekiel 36, 25 says this, I will sprinkle clean water on you 
and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So this is interesting because Nicodemus totally knows the Old Testament. I mean, the the Pharisees, if anyone knew the Old Testament, it would be the Pharisees. They actually had to memorize books of the Bible, like probably at least five. They probably memorized more. So Nicodemus would be very familiar with this passage as well. And what's interesting here is that there's this idea that God is going to sprinkle clean water on, and this clean water is going to remove impurity, and there's going to have to be a new heart. You need a heart transplant is what, what God's saying. You need a new heart. And this this heart of flesh will be able to be receptive to the Holy Spirit. And you'll be able to move and follow the decrees of God. And you'll be pliable and open and willing to follow the Holy Spirit. And then finally, if you, luckily you don't have to turn too far. But this is Ezekiel 37, verse 3. So this is very nearby. So in this part, Ezekiel is a, is a prophet and, and he sees this this valley of dry bones and this, this vision. And God is going to, going to bring that, that valley of dry bones and bring it to life and and make human beings out of that, that valley of dry bones. So in verse three, it says, he asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So again, that word breath coming to life. So so all these passage, passages indicate that there is something that isn't moving. There's something that's dead. There's, there's dust. There's a valley of dry bones. There needs to be the Holy Spirit breathing life into these things in order to animate them and to make them move and live and have their being. And also there, there needs to be some kind of cleansing of sin. There needs to be a new heart. There's a, there's an old heart. It's of stone. It becomes a new heart and it's, it's flesh. So when Jesus is saying you need to be born again, he's telling Nicodemus, Nicodemus, There's something wrong with the way the Jewish faith is at this time. There is such an emphasis on pharisaical legalism and you do this, you do this, you follow this, you, you, you prove yourself in in your sense of self-righteousness that you are worthy of God. And he's saying, Nicodemus, that's not the kingdom of God. And I wonder how Nicodemus took that because Nicodemus is the teaching elite of, of, of the Jewish state. And to be told that everything you're doing is wrong. <laughs> I wonder how insulting he you know, may have found that to be. To be told that you're, you are the elite of this profession, but you're doing it all wrong. That would be quite a statement to hear. But Jesus loves him enough to say it truly, truly, Nicodemus. This is, this is, what, the, this is what the new birth is all about. So you need to be born again. <clears throat> I actually, sometimes I find myself using Instagram reels a good bit. And my wife has now put a timer on my phone to keep me from scrolling. So I don't know if you know much about social media, but they actually designed it like a slot machine. So that's why when you get videos after video, it goes up and up and up. And Facebook mini feed does that, all that. The the creators of social media did that because they they know in slot machines with casinos, that's how... That's how it works. It triggers dopamine in your head. So I'm already aware of that, but I do it anyway. So, <laughs> so I'm scrolling and, and then now I have a, a time limit that's set on my phone. So I'm very, I'm actually like pretty, pretty thrilled about it because now I have like more time. But, but what's, what's interesting is I saw a reel of Lil Wayne and Lil Wayne is this rapper. You usually can't understand anything he's saying. Um, but, but he comes out with a lot of music. He's super talented. Like he actually has like very clever rhymes and it's really interesting. But, but I, I was like, whoa, like I, lo- I saw his shirt is like this red shirt and it said born again, Christian Dior. And I don't know, I didn't know who Christian Dior is, but I guess that's like a fashion company or something. They make clothing or whatever, purses or whatever. I didn't really know what it was about. But anyway, yeah, it was just interesting. It's like Lil Wayne, like said born again. And then by Christian Dior and it's like, 
huh, I wonder what he thinks about that statement, like being born again. Because if you've ever talked to people about what they think about this term, being born again, they have very different opinions about this idea. I went to the dog park one time, and I was trying to connect with these two guys, and, and one of them had two Labradors, and my dog's a lap, so, so they were able to be buddies. And this other guy had this, I think it was one of those sheep herding dogs, so he had a lot of energy and ran really fast. But so anyway, I would like connect with these guys and talk to them, and for whatever reason, we're talking about the Harvest Crusade, and and one of the guys said, yeah, isn't that for those born-agains? Yeah, those born-again people, right? And I was like, I, I don't know, what do you mean by born-again people? And he's like, you yeah, know, like the Christians, you know, that, that kind of Christian that's like born-again or something. I was like, I don't know, like, you know, what do you... And so I was saying, well, I mean, do you mean like a, like a real Christian? Because that's like, like what a real Christian's like is someone who's born-again. And the other guy's like, I've never heard of that term, born-again. Like, like, what's that? And I was like, oh, well, like, it's in the Bible, like, like John three, like where it talks about being born again. And, and so, so like, Oh, that's interesting. And yeah. So it's, if you talk to people, like there's this cultural idea of like, Oh, if you're a born again Christian, you're like a Jesus freak. Like, like there's, you're one of the hardcore ones or I don't know what they think. Like, but that, that, that term is thrown around a lot. But in reality, what Jesus is saying is if you're born again, you're like, just, you're just like a, like a regular believer. Like every believer is born again. It's not, it's not like that, special of a, of a term if you will it's not like you have the christians and then you have the more elite like born again christians it's like no 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 like if you're a christian like you're born again so what's what's so crazy though is that jesus is saying you you can't even see the kingdom of god you can't enter the kingdom of god unless you're born again you have to, you have to, there has to be some kind of death and, and a rebirth well it does like bait the question of how that even happens because because if if jesus is describing the Holy Spirit as like a wind, then that means the wind, you, you can't see the wind. You, you can see the effects of wind. Like when you see a tornado or hurricane, you're like, huh, I think like a, a mighty wind traveled through this area because look at all this <laughs> change to the landscape, right? So you can see the effects of the wind, right? You can't see the wind and you, you can't determine the direction really of, of, of the wind, but you can certainly, you know, witness witness there is a wind right so with with this idea of of the holy spirit having the sovereign will he he does choose to do what he wants to do and it's really cool when he does it because he sometimes he does it out of nowhere i had this college friend for instance and i remember i unfortunately had this thought back in the day where i was kind of like uh like he's a little too far gone you know sometimes you have that thought about people and then god like humbles you and then <laughs> saves them. <laughs> so that's basically what he did with this friend of mine. So he, he, he brought him to faith and I, I was like, wait, you're, you're a Christian now? Yeah, it was, it was really cool, but it was, it's amazing how the Holy Spirit just, he does what he wants and his will. And he'll just, he'll just move in someone's life. And it's like the wind just like showed up out of nowhere. I think for the, for the, the idea of wind, I don't know if you've ever really thought about how interesting of a concept that is. Like just the fact that there there is wind but but a lot of people also mock the idea of wind sometimes culturally like have you ever heard of this movie american beauty there's this scene in it where there's like a trash bag and it's being moved around by the wind and and it's supposed to be like a beautiful scene it's like oh look how beautiful like the trash bag is dancing in the wind but i think the simpsons are someone that, that like made fun of it and they're like oh look like they're like how beautiful the trash is or something like that you know so so sometimes people like have this idea of wind where it's like um, you know, they, they have cultural expectations of it, or they, um, you know, have certain perceptions of, of how the wind, you know, is, is personified or, you know, metaphorically illustrated, but how Jesus is using it here, he's saying when the Holy Spirit is, is moving and doing his thing, it's like the wind. It's, it's like, you, you can't tell it's, it's, um, you know, origin or like where it's coming from, but you can certainly see how it affects someone's life. And when someone is affected by the Holy Spirit and transformed, you will notice a change there, there will be, there will be a change. Yeah. And sometimes it's really strong. Sometimes it's like out of nowhere. And, you know, I remember there was actually one time when I was in school and there was this giant open area and it was unfortunately like a wind tunnel because it was very flat and it was also super windy, I think, because the wind was coming off the lake, but it was actually so strong. Sometimes I had to like walk backwards back to my room because it was, it was so intense. Um, but I, I actually find that the, the idea of the Holy Spirit moving and, and the wind is he, he's gentle. 
in, in how he works. I mean, he can, he can certainly disrupt us and wake us up. But a lot of times the way the Holy Spirit works is like a gentle leading, a, a, a leading us to Christ. So let's go on to, to John um, 3, verse 9. Let's keep going here. It says this, How can this be, Nic- Nicodemus asks? You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and, do not, and you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify of what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes may have eternal life. So again, Jesus is essentially saying, hey, Nicodemus, like, you don't have the right teaching. Like, I mean, when you really think about what he's saying, he's, he's essentially calling Nicodemus like a false teacher when it comes down to it. So, so he's, he's saying, hey, like, you're not listening to us. So when Jesus is, is saying that, like that, you, that you're not listening to us or, or our testimony, he, he's talking about actually the prophets also. He's talking about everyone who's spoken on behalf of God and Jesus is saying, myself, I'm speaking on behalf of the Father. Like we're trying to, we're trying to speak this truth or this testimony, but, but you guys aren't receiving it. These, these blind guides, these people that, that don't get it. So he's, he's saying like, if I, if I even speak of, you know, earthly things and you're not understanding it, what happens when I speak of heavenly things and you don't understand it? And he refers himself as this son of man. And we've, we've talked about this idea of son of man, but in Daniel seven, it's, it's probably the most prominent word. It says that there's, there's a son of man. He's going to come on the clouds. He's going to be given glory and dominion, power, and he'll be worshiped. But it's interesting because he's, he's a distinct in a sense, um, He's not like separate, like like a like a like a completely different entity, but he is. Um, it, it says that there's there's an ancient of days, or like you, you, we say, God the Father, who who he, somehow like the ancient of days, who is God, and also God the Son, Jesus, the Son of Man, is worshipped, and obviously we don't worship anyone other than who is God. So, so for Jesus, he is he is seen as the son of God. He is, he is the son of man. He is, he is to be worshiped and followed. And he's referring himself as the son of man and through whom we are to be born again. Also with this, this passage, I think what's, what's fascinating about it too is, is Jesus is, is pointing to this idea of Nicodemus, like you need to really hear what I'm saying, but, but it's about belief and it's not so much about all these rules and regulations that you're trying to have all these people do there there's something much deeper than just the rule keeping there's something much much deeper than just the outward appearances of religion and what he's saying is hey nicodemus like i am the son of man i am someone who actually has been in heaven like you've been on earth but but my home is in heaven I'm, i'm i'm from heaven i'm i'm from the father so listen to me i'm going to just double check on our questions real quick just see if anyone has any questions so far and uh yeah we may in the future kind of disregard the questions we're still trying to like figure things out as we go along but i'm loading it if you do have any questions for the future just yeah let me know when we'll we'll answer them okay i don't see any questions at the moment for for this time i think we missed one at the end of last week though okay cool well, let's get back to it. I would say for me, I feel a lot like Nicodemus, especially before becoming a Christian, because I think I was doing the Christian life in a sense without the Holy Spirit. And I think what it ends up looking like is, you know, like, you know, being a nice guy and attending church. But, but in terms of my affections and like what I prioritize most, it wasn't God. It was success and performance and trying to be the best that I could be in, in a lot of ways. That, and that was, to me, more important than, than God himself. I remember talking to someone on the, on the street outside of Irvine High School. I was trying to share my faith with some students. I remember the student came up to me and he said, yeah, you know, I tried the Christian thing and it didn't really work. And I said, really? Like, what? Tell me about it. And he said, well, you know, I like, I tried to, 
you know, do all the Christian stuff, like, you know, behave really morally well. And, you know, I just found that it didn't really work at all. Like I, um, I couldn't, you know, stop sinning sexually. I was, I just struggle all the time and, you know, I'm trying to not do it, you know, but, but, um, yeah, I just, uh, I just stopped doing the Christian thing, you know, it wasn't for me, you know? And I was, I was hearing, I was hearing him say this and I, I realized that, that he hadn't actually put his trust yet in Jesus and been born again. I, I noticed that he was trying to do the things that you, you have access to. Uh, to do as a Christian, but without the power of the Holy Spirit. So it was like, yeah, I'm trying to, you know, live this holy life, but I, I realized I can't do it on my own. And so I remember just him, you know, trying to, trying to exhort him to consider Christ, like, like actually, like how the Christian life is done. And the Christian life is done by recognizing that we can't live that holy life apart from Christ. And we do need to be made anew. We actually need a new heart, a heart that's sensitive to God. And what's really cool about this passage is Jesus explains how to be born again. Because that's, that, that, may, that maybe bugs you a little bit as you're reading this passage and you're like, well, then how do you be born again? And then what's really cool about how Jesus says it is he, he describes this Old Testament passage. And so let's, let's turn there. It's in Numbers 21. So let's head back to Numbers 21. And he talks about Moses and this idea of serpents so if you head to Moses, or sorry, not Moses, Numbers 21, Moses wrote it, but Numbers 21, verse 4. So just for a little context of this passage, the Israelites are in the desert. They have been liberated from Egypt, but they're complaining, as we find ourselves probably in their shoes a lot of times too, complaining. Yeah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. You there? Okay, Numbers 21, verse 4. It's just a couple of verses. So the Israelites are traveling in the desert. They're stuck there because they're not obeying God. But it says they travel from Mount Hor along the route to, route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said... Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the, they bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Take a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who's bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. Have you ever looked at an ambulance before? Perhaps a hospital. Maybe you've seen a pole with a snake on it. Have you noticed that? Yeah. So that is a reference to this passage. Yeah. That there's going to be a healing, but in order to be healed, you have to look at this snake on a pole. Right. So, so that's where I, I never realized that until I think someone had mentioned it and I looked a little, sometimes I don't look closely at stuff and I'm like, oh, it is a snake on a pole. Never noticed that. Yeah. But it's really cool when you see it, it's like, oh, okay. That's like from the Bible and it, it's everywhere. It's like on all like kinds of medical stuff. If you look hard enough, but what's, what's interesting is the Israelites are sinning against God. They're complaining. And then God's like, I'm tired of this. Okay. Venomous snakes, go get them. <laughs> And you can just imagine this camp just like, ah, just like screaming and not screaming from fear, but screaming from the, the pain and people are dying. And yeah, it's, yeah, it'd probably be a gruesome scene. Right. But, but then now there's they're like, okay, well, like, uh, Moses, you know, like pray and help us. What's interesting is how the remedy is made because it could have just been the case that Moses prays to God and God's like, okay, I'm done. All right. So I'm, I'm, I'm I got, you know, got my wrath out. Okay. Like I'm done. But the remedy is a snake on a pole. Why a snake on a pole? Well, because it's, it's going to be messianic. It's, it's a reference to a future event that's going to happen. And yeah, in a sense, I mean, Moses could have said, Lord, I pray that you would stop the snakes from, you know, biting your people who are complaining. And, and that would have been it. But God's like, make a, make a little statue, make a, you know, set up a little stick, you know, create a little bronze uh, snake. And then, all they need to do is look at it. They don't need to like pet it. They don't need to give it a high five or you can't give a snake a high five. But I mean,
you there's you just need to like look at the snake on the pole and then you're healed. That's the solution. So what what Jesus is saying is I am that snake on a pole to whom you look and you will be healed. This this is so antithetical to the religious system of the day which is do 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 don't do don't do don't do don't do like like it was all around effort behavior doing and not doing and jesus is saying no the only thing you do is you look you look to the one who was held up high and was considered a curse what's cool about the bronze snake thing is that it's in the form of a snake. It could have been in a lot of different other forms, but it's interesting how the thing that is causing the damage is going to be the thing through which people will be healed. So when, when Jesus is pointing to this, this is going to be a theme throughout John as, as we're going through it this year. But, but there's this idea of Jesus is saying, I'm going to be lifted up. This is my hour. I'm, I'm going to be like this snake that is lifted up. So we're, I mean, as much as sometimes you want to beat up the Israelites, like, oh, stupid people, look, they're complaining against God. And it's like, when you really think about it, like, I mean, don't we do that too? Like, don't, don't we have like our fist at God a lot of times and, you know, demand things from him and, uh, you know, blaspheme him or how, however you want to say that, you know, we, 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 we have sinned against God and we've, we've done it a number of times. Romans 1 says, for although they knew God referring to us humans, although They knew God. They neither glorified him as God nor give thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And so that's all of us. The Bible says that all of us have sinned. All of us have gone astray. All of us have gone to our each own way. But the Lord has laid on him or Jesus, the iniquity of us all. So 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, that God made him, Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So what that means is that Jesus became the very curse that would end up saving us. So you can think about it like this, that sin was the thing, was like, was like the snakes that were destroying the people. But Jesus, even though he's not a snake, he was treated as if he was one, if he was the curse, if he was a cursed one. And so in that sense, that's how uh, Jesus is, uh, who had no sin, but, but was in a sense made sin for us. So he, so Jesus was made to be sin for us in the sense that Jesus was, was treated as a curse, even though we're the ones who are cursed. And in that great exchange, we become the righteousness of God. So now with the, the idea of being born again, Jesus is saying, all you need to do is look. All you need to do is look to the cross. There's no like fancy, do this and this ritual, or you got to be this holy or, or this, that. Like, like your righteousness is like filthy rags compared to Christ. And so instead, the, the God's solution is to look to the bronze snake. Look, look to the cross, the one who was lifted up and became a curse for us. And, and when we do that, when we do that simple trusting in Jesus, and it's not a work in ourselves, it's a gift of God. It's something that God does in us. It's, the Holy Spirit just causes that in our hearts. It's like, oh my gosh, I believe. How, like it, it became alive to you. Like I'm sure you've heard of like Christmas and Easter beforehand. And you're like, yeah, Christmas and Easter, whatever. You know? And then all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, it's like, like Jesus was here. Like Jesus actually rose from the dead and Jesus is God. Like these truths become like a deep reality in your soul. And you're like, Oh my gosh, like I really believe this. <laughs> like, like the Holy spirit did something in your heart. He changed your heart. He, he moved l- l- like the wind. And I like this quote by RC Sproul and it's in your notes. You can check it out for later. But he says, if you have in your heart today, any affection for Christ at all, it is because God, the Holy spirit in his sweetness, in his power, in his mercy, and in his grace has been to the cemetery of your soul and has raised you from the dead. So we were dead. But now the Holy Spirit has breathed life into us. He's, he's sprinkled water onto us. He's, he's, he's brought something from, from death to life. And as we are being compelled by the Spirit, as we are walking in the Holy Spirit as Christians, let's continue to be soft-hearted and pliable. 
So I have a couple props here. Sometimes I, I can be a prop guy. I try not to over prop it. Have you heard of like carrot? Have you heard of that comedian Carrot Top before? Yeah, he's like a prop dude, like total prop dude. But I do like props. That I, you know, there's, there's sometimes you can have too many props. I think. So anyway, here is um, well, this is self-explanatory, but um, this is a, a weapon of sorts. But uh, notice how hard it is. And what happens if I try to blow on it? Did, will it will it bend? Will the no? It's like it's like I could even press on. It's not going to bend, you know. And so this is like our hearts against God. We have an agenda, a vendetta against God. Our our hearts are weaponized against the Lord, <laughs> apart from Him. But but in order for us to change, He has to change that heart of flesh, and He make uh, change that heart of stone. He turns into heart of flesh. And this is uh, from my avocado tree, which never gives us avocados, maybe because we don't water it enough. Because yeah, just so much water. But anyway, um, l- let you know w- when our hearts are more like this. You know, it's like you know this thing is like very pliable. It moves to the wind, right? Uh, the Holy Spirit, as they say, he's a gentleman. So he's he's not this bone-crushing dictator that's going to, like, you know, grind your face into the dirt until you comply. Um, we can we can grieve the Holy Spirit. We can not listen to him. Um, but it has a lot to do with the with the condition of our hearts, right? And so, so obviously, we, we're pretty used to a life of how we lived in the flesh with a stony heart. I mean, that's what, that's what God is working in our hearts all throughout the rest of our lives now is, is constant conformity to the will of Christ. But fortunately, we do have a new heart. Like, like God gave us a new heart that is receptive to his will, that, that now grieves over sin, that, that wants to live righteously, that wants to please God. And so let's, let's live lives that are like that. Let's live lives that are open to the will of God. Let's, let's be available to him and work by the Holy Spirit. And, and don't, don't worry. Don't worry if like you feel like you haven't got it figured out of like how to follow God yet. Like in terms of follow the direction of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you might hear other people saying like, wow, they really hear from God. I, I wish I could do that, you know, and you know, it, don't worry about it. Like it's a journey. It, it, it takes a lot of time with God and, and, and doing life with God to be able to know even what God wants, but also like how to do it. So I think the more and more I've walked with God, the more and more I've, I've also noticed opportunities that the Holy Spirit is presenting before me. So every week we try to tell everyone, right, you know, we're going to prayer, care, and share this week. We're going to be, we're going to be open. We're going to, we're going to pray for people who don't know Christ. We're going to care for them in a meaningful way that will point them to Jesus, but, but also potentially share, you know, like just maybe there's a possibility to, to share your story. So there's one guy I was driving this week and I drove him from, I think it was like maybe Costa Mesa area back up to Santa Ana. So I'm talking to him. He's like a valet driver and we're just talking about his job or what have you. I usually have a couple opening lines where it's like, I, I just say, oh yeah, you know, you've been in the area for a while or, or I, I know they were working. It's like, oh yeah, like what do you do for your job? I try to talk to him for a while about that. It was really fascinating. This, this question came out of nowhere, but it was in the context of his, of his job. He said, yeah, you know, I have this, I had this boss and he died and I feel really bad for his family. And he asked me a question, like usually people don't ask questions out of nowhere like this, but he did. And he said, how do you, how do you deal with grief? Like when you're watching other people grieving through things, I said, really? Well, interesting question there. And, but I, 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 I sensed in the, in that moment, I felt like the Holy Spirit was like, I'm offering you an opportunity on a platter, you know, here you go. (laughs) So I told him, I said, yeah, I mean, that's, that's really hard. I, I think for me personally, as I'm, I'm witnessing people grieving, I think just being there for them, you know, sometimes we don't know what to say to grieving people and it's okay. Maybe you don't have to say like the perfect thing and, and whatever thing you, you think would magically fix their like situation or make them feel better. Probably it it may not be as ideal if you tried it uh, as it sounds in your head. So, you know, I would say like, I was telling him, you know, just being present and, you know, maybe there's something small you can do, like just to show that you care and it doesn't have to be this, this huge thing to, to show that. But, but I also told him personally, I said, you know, but for me, like we all process through grief and I, I pointed him to, to a Psalm maybe to, to read for himself. But I, I said, one of the things that makes grief so hard is the lack of hope. That's what makes grief so terrible is, you know, the Bible talks about, we, you know, as, as believers, 
we, we don't grieve as the world does, you know, who, who doesn't have hope. We, we have a hope and, and that helps us with our grief. It's like, wow, like I, I have hope for the future. You know, think about it, like for people, you know, who, who don't have that reality of heaven and, and that there's a good God and he's going to, he's going to, you know, save people that, you know, there, there isn't, there isn't hope. Like, like you, you don't know what's going to happen. Right. So that's why the grief is so hard for people. But, but I, I, I essentially told him, I say, you know, like, but, but my faith in Jesus has, has helped me like have hope and, and that helps me like process through grief and especially witnessing other people grieving. It, it helps me like with them and he, he took it in. It was interesting. Yeah. He, he, he absorbed it. He wasn't like argumentative about it. he, he seemed receptive to what I was saying, you know? So, um, again, like, like this is a, this is a journey with the Holy Spirit as we're, as we're born again by him, but also our whole lives. It's not like, okay, thank you, Holy Spirit for that one time moment where you made me born again. And I'll, I'll see you in heaven. Like, you know, Jesus is saying that the Holy Spirit is now our counselor. He's like, he's, he, he is our person who, who we're going to walk with our entire life. And he's going to be our, our soul's best friend as we're, as we're, we're journeying through this life. So yeah, let's continue to have an open heart to God and how he works. Let's, let's be pliable and not resisting him. And, um, yeah, just encourage you guys just to continue to, to walk with the Lord. Yeah. Be open to him.